Roe v. Wade is one of the most debated and controversial rulings by the Supreme Court of the United States in recent decades. The question is, what does Roe v. Wade even say? In this video, I'm going to present material in two parts. The first, we're just going to look at a description of the conclusions that Roe v. Wade articulates. So what were some of the outcomes? What were some of the changes to the law that resulted from Roe v. Wade? This part of the video is going to be very descriptive in nature. I'm not arguing for one position or another. I'm not saying that the court got things right or the court got things wrong. All I want to do in the first part of the video is just get clear on what the court even said. So this is going to be helpful regardless of where you stand in the abortion debate, whether you think that abortion should be legal or you think that it should be illegal. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of this video. We're just looking at what does the Supreme Court say in Roe v. Wade. In the second part of the video, we're going to look at some of the arguments or justifications that the court gave on behalf of its conclusions. And to give a short preview, there are going to be three major arguments found in Roe v. Wade in support of its conclusions that we're going to look at in this video. They are the historical argument regarding abortion, an argument based on the 14th Amendment and the right to privacy, and third, an argument from the neutrality of the law. So when we get to this part of the video, I'm going to describe these arguments, but I'm also going to describe some criticisms that have been raised against them. The idea here is just going to be to present, here's what the court argued, and then some responses from critics. So first, what does Roe v. Wade conclude? What are some of the outcomes, some of the conclusions of this ruling? Here I'm just going to try to describe some of the outcomes of the ruling. So first, pregnancy is going to be divided into three trimesters, and what the government can do in terms of restricting access to abortion will change depending on what trimester a pregnant person is in. So to start, during the first trimester of pregnancy, the Supreme Court says the abortion decision and its effectuation must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. In other words, the state cannot interfere with access to abortion during the first trimester. If a woman goes to her doctor and they decide that an abortion is best for her, for whatever reason, the state has no right to interfere in these cases. So during the first trimester, the state can't do anything whatsoever to restrict access to abortion. The court continues, during the second trimester, the state, in promoting its interest in the health of the mother, may, if it chooses, regulate the abortion procedure in ways that are reasonably related to maternal health. In other words, during the second trimester, different states in the U.S. can enact laws that are designed to protect the health of the mother. So, for example, if the state wants to make sure that facilities in which abortions are being performed are clean and sanitary and safe, they can enact laws to ensure that that's the case. Any sort of law that protects the mother's health can be put into place here, even if that means restricting access to abortion. Under this part of the ruling, too, you might see things like states requiring 24-hour wait periods where someone who's pregnant goes to the doctor, decides to have an abortion, and then has to wait 24 hours before they can actually get the procedure. The thought there might be something like, it's in the best interest of the patient to make sure that they give their informed consent for the procedure, and in order to give your informed consent for this procedure, you have to weigh the options and think about it for at least 24 hours. And the idea there is, yeah, you are restricting access to abortion by requiring this wait time, but this delay is being done for the sake of the health of the mother, or in this case, to secure informed consent, which is part of good medical care. But otherwise, the state doesn't have any sort of right to restrict access to abortion. So if a law is put into place and it restricts access to abortion, but it doesn't actually protect or promote a mother's health, then that law is unconstitutional. So during the second trimester, the only restrictions a state can put in place are those that actually promote or protect the health of the mother. During the third trimester, then, the court says, the state, in promoting its interest in the potentiality of human life, may, if it chooses, regulate and even prescribe, that is, prohibit, abortion, except where it is necessary in appropriate medical judgment for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. What the court is saying here is that if a state wants to make abortion illegal during the third trimester, they can do that, but they have to allow certain exceptions. So they can't prohibit abortion in cases where abortion is needed to protect a mother's life, and they can't prohibit abortion in cases where abortion is required to protect a woman's health. But in any case, the third trimester is where states are given the most power to restrict access to abortion. So just to summarize really quick, during the first trimester, the state can't restrict access to abortion. 
If a woman wants to obtain an abortion, that's between her and her doctor. The state can't do anything whatsoever to interfere. In the second trimester, the state can't restrict access to abortion at all either, unless those restrictions actually protect the mother's health. So requiring that clinics be safe, requiring that they be clean, requiring that they have hospital-grade equipment, or that practitioners have admitting privileges to the hospital so that if something goes wrong, they can transfer their patients to the hospital immediately. Those sorts of restrictions could be justified under this part of the ruling in the sense that they're designed to protect the health of the mother. So access to abortion can be restricted during the second trimester if those restrictions protect or promote the health of the mother. Then during the third trimester, the state can make abortion illegal unless an abortion is required to protect a mother's life or to protect a mother's health. Now we need to look really closely at the details of this ruling. So if you look at what the court has to say about the second and third trimester, during the second trimester, the court ruled that states may restrict access to abortion in order to protect a woman's health. In other words, they have no obligation whatsoever to restrict access to abortion during the second trimester. They may do that. The states may restrict access to abortion if the state wants to protect the mother's health, but they have no obligation whatsoever to do it. So if a state says, you know what, we're just not going to restrict abortion during the second trimester at all, the court is saying that's perfectly legal. So it's perfectly legal for a state to have no restrictions during the second trimester. That means if the state doesn't want to put any restrictions in place in terms of waiting times or in terms of how the facilities are, whether or not they're up to hospital standards or not, the states don't have to do anything at all. They can just say abortion is unrestricted during the second trimester if they want. So Roe v. Wade is legalizing that. They're saying if you don't want to put in any restrictions on abortion during the second trimester, that's perfectly legal. The same language actually shows up when we look at what the court says about the third trimester as well. So again, the court ruled that states may outlaw abortion during the third trimester, but that's entirely optional. So again, if a state wants to say we're going to allow abortion during the third trimester for whatever reason a woman chooses, that's perfectly legal. The state can do that. They don't have to restrict access to abortion at all during the third trimester if they don't want to. So what that means is Roe v. Wade made it legal for states to allow abortion even during the third trimester for whatever reason whatsoever if that's what the states wanted to do. So if we look at our list, during the first trimester, there's no restrictions allowed. During the second trimester and third trimesters, the states can restrict access to abortion if they want to, but they certainly don't have to. Again, according to Roe v. Wade, it would be perfectly legal for states to allow abortion throughout the entirety of pregnancy. In fact, consistent with Roe v. Wade on this point, there are several states and regions in the U.S. today that just don't put a time limit on when an abortion can be obtained during pregnancy. So these states or regions include Alaska, Colorado, Washington, D.C., New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, and Vermont. There's no law on the books in these states or in these regions that says abortion cannot be performed after a certain time. And Roe v. Wade is fine with that. Roe v. Wade is saying if a state wants to allow abortion during the third trimester all the way up to birth, that's perfectly legal. Now, this was really shocking to people at the time. So in 1973, the court noted the Texas statutes under attack here are typical of those that have been in effect in many states for approximately a century. In other words, Texas restricted abortion quite a bit. They only allowed it in cases to save a mother's life, but a lot of states had similar laws. That's what the court is saying. So by striking down Texas's law, again, Texas said you can only get an abortion in cases where it's saving a mother's life. By striking down that law in Texas, it struck down laws across the nation that were very similar in many states. So in many places across the nation, overnight, you went from having laws that said abortion is illegal unless it's to save a mother's life to saying abortion is legal all the way up to birth. That's perfectly fine if a state wants to allow it. States had the option of restricting access to abortion in the second trimester under certain circumstances. They had the option to restrict access to abortion during the third trimester if they wanted. But again, no obligation to put any restrictions into law here. Now there's one more important observation to get clear on here with respect to the three trimester framework, and that is 
Notice that when it comes to the third trimester, this is where states are supposed to be given the most power to restrict access to abortion. The court had said states can essentially prohibit abortion, they can make it illegal, unless those restrictions interfere with the life or health of the mother. So if getting an abortion is required to preserve the life of the mother, the state can't interfere. And if getting an abortion is required to protect the health of the mother, the state can't interfere with that either. So essentially the court is saying abortion is legal during the third trimester if it's necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. The state can't stop access to abortion in those cases. But this raises some important questions because when somebody's life is threatened, that might be really clear. It might be clear that if this pregnancy continues any longer and an abortion is not performed, the mother is going to die. That sort of case might be really clear. But what is the court talking about when they're talking about protecting the health of the mother? We're no longer talking about protecting the life. It's not a life and death matter. We're talking about protecting health. So what does health mean according to the court? And Roe v. Wade doesn't define health, but Roe v. Wade was issued the very same day as another ruling called Doe v. Bolton. And in these rulings, it was stated that the two were supposed to be read together. And the definition of health shows up in Doe v. Bolton. So you had Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, both issued the same day, and Roe v. Wade says states can't interfere with abortion access in the third trimester if the abortion is required to protect the mother's health. Doe v. Bolton explains what health means. So according to the Supreme Court, health is to be understood in light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and related to a woman's age, relevant to the well-being of the patient. All of these factors may relate to health. Health includes a lot of things. We're not just talking about physical health. We're including mental, emotional, familial. What that means then is that if continued pregnancy during a third trimester poses a threat to the emotional well-being of the patient, the state cannot stop that patient from obtaining an abortion. So even in cases where a patient and a fetus are perfectly healthy in a physical sense, if the continued pregnancy is causing emotional distress, interfering with the emotional health of the patient, then the state has no right to prevent that patient from getting an abortion during the third trimester. Now, critics are really unhappy at this point. They'll say that Roe v. Wade said that states should be allowed to restrict abortion access during the third trimester, but because health is defined so broadly, it includes so many different things, the state has no power to stop a woman from getting an abortion during the third trimester. So again, she could be physically perfectly healthy, but if she and her physician meet and decide that continued pregnancy is, is causing an emotional damage, then the state has no right to stop the abortion in the third trimester. Or to put it differently, critics will say, because health was defined so broadly, it includes so many things, the state has no power to step in and stop abortions from occurring even during the third trimester. Critics will say then that Roe v. Wade really gave the state no power to stop abortion at any time during pregnancy. Or to use a phrase from the last session of this class, critics will say that Roe v. Wade led to abortion on demand. That is, Roe v. Wade allowed abortion to be performed at any time during pregnancy for any reason. Or again, the effect of Roe v. Wade was to say the state couldn't really stop abortion from occurring at any point during the pregnancy. But abortion on demand, this idea of allowing abortion at any time during the pregnancy for pretty much any reason, was something the court did not want to legalize. So in the text of Roe v. Wade itself, the court says, some people have argued that a woman's right is absolute and that she's entitled to terminate her pregnancy at whatever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she alone chooses. With this, we do not agree. In other words, the court is saying that some people have argued that the right to abortion, that's just a matter of choice. A woman should be free to choose when she wants an abortion, under what circumstances, for what reasons, and just be totally left alone to make that choice. It's, it's entirely up to that person. The court is saying they don't agree with that. They don't agree that abortion is just this matter of choice, that a woman should be free to make the choice whenever she wants for whatever reasons. They actually reject that type of reasoning altogether. So we have this weird tension where, based on how the three trimester model was written and how health was defined, it seemed like the outcome was that states didn't have any power to stop abortion access at any part of pregnancy. But at the same time, the court was saying quite explicitly that they didn't want to allow abortion on demand. They didn't want to allow abortion for any reason at any time during pregnancy. 
So the outcome of Roe v. Wade seems to be in tension. It seems to conflict with what the justices themselves believed. In other words, the Supreme Court did not accept the view that abortion is just a completely private matter that shouldn't be restricted. It's entirely up to the choice of the pregnant woman. Rather, they said a state may properly assert important interests in safeguarding health and in maintaining medical standards and in protecting potential life. So there are multiple ways in which the state has the right to interfere with access to abortion. They can stop abortion from occurring in cases where it's not safe for a mother. And theoretically, they're supposed to be given the power to stop abortion during the third trimester. But given how health was defined, it made it very difficult for states to implement those restrictions. To put this a little bit differently, the goal of Roe v. Wade, the stated goal of Roe v. Wade, was to balance power between three entities. You have the state, the pregnant woman, and the fetus. And the idea was, as pregnancy progresses, the state's interest in protecting a fetus increases as well. So as pregnancy goes on, the state has more and more reason to protect what the court called potential life. This meant that there would become a tipping point, which again is about where the third trimester starts, where the state can actually prevent a woman from accessing abortion. However, because the court ruled that states can't interfere when an abortion is required to protect the health or the life of the mother, health is defined in such a way that states' ability to actually act on this, to actually restrict access to abortion, was dramatically limited. So rather than balancing the power between the state, the pregnant woman, and the fetus, you ended up with the state losing all of its power and all of the power kind of shifting to the pregnant person. So critics will argue here that Roe v. Wade actually didn't accomplish the goals that it stated it wanted to accomplish. They said they didn't want to bring about abortion on demand, but the way they wrote the ruling led to abortion on demand. So again, the point here is just that the outcome of Roe v. Wade, the impact that it had, the changes it brought about, were in conflict with the stated goals of the justices who wrote Roe v. Wade. So just to recap a little bit, the court said the state can't restrict access to abortion during the first trimester. During the second trimester, they can restrict access if doing so protects the health of the mother. And during the third trimester, the state can make abortion illegal unless abortion is required to protect the life or health of the mother. In those cases, the state can't interfere with access to abortion. But what reasons, what arguments did they give for this three trimester model? There are three major arguments that we're gonna be looking at in this video. And those are the historical argument, the 14th Amendment argument, or an argument from privacy, and the neutrality of law argument. So three separate arguments that are supposed to support the decision that was made in Roe v. Wade. So just to start, looking at the historical argument, it goes roughly like this. First, throughout much of history, abortion access was much more open than it presently was in 1973. Second, in the U.S., the reason that abortion was made illegal in the first place during the mid-1800s was because the procedure itself, the abortion procedure itself, posed a grave threat to women's health. Third, with advances in medical technology, including advances in antibiotics, as of 1973, abortion procedures no longer posed a threat to women's health. So based on this line of argument, since abortion was made illegal in the first place to protect women's health, and now abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure, we no longer have a compelling reason to make abortion illegal. So the, again, the, the whole reason that abortion was made illegal was to protect women's health because the abortion procedure was really dangerous, but the abortion procedure is not dangerous today, and so we no longer have a reason to make abortion illegal. So since we no longer have a good reason to make abortion illegal, it's no longer a threat to women's health, it should be legalized. Now, critics are really going to focus in on this second statement here, this idea that the reason that abortion was made illegal in the first place was because the state was trying to protect women's health. They're going to say that that's just false. There are also going to be some criticisms directed at the third statement, but really the second statement is where most of the disagreement occurs that I'm aware of. So when we look at the second claim here, this idea that abortion was made illegal simply to protect women's health, we've got to look back at history and ask the question, why was abortion made illegal in the first place? So the Supreme Court gives their answer. They say abortion was made illegal because the state wanted to protect women's health from this dangerous procedure. But critics are going to disagree and say that historically speaking, that doesn't hold up. 
If you look at the history of abortion law, there are different reasons that states made abortion illegal during the mid-1800s. For example, critics will point to the American Medical Association and argue that this medical association was one of the major reasons that abortion was made illegal. The AMA was one of the major factors that was driving this push to make abortion illegal during the mid-1800s. And so critics will go further and say there was good reason for that. This had to do with changes in how we understood biology. This is going to be a very rough sketch of the idea, but before the 1800s, the idea was pregnancy was divided into two parts, and the point that separated those two parts was called quickening. So prior to quickening, it was believed that you didn't have a living human being. The content of pregnancy prior to quickening was inanimate matter. It was just a clump of matter. Whereas when quickening occurs, that's when a mother can actually feel the fetus move. So when the mother can feel the fetus move, that's when the fetus's life begins, because the thought was that's when the soul kind of enters the matter. That's when the, the soul enters the body. And so from that point on, you needed to protect that being under the law. But prior to quickening, there was no being there to be protected. It was just matter. So if the contents of pregnancy were destroyed before quickening, that wasn't the same as killing a person. Whereas after quickening, that was when the law needed to start protecting life. So that's kind of how the law operated before the 1800s. Again, the idea in the law before the 1800s was prior to quickening, there's no life there that deserves protection under the law, but after quickening, when the fetus starts moving or the movements are felt by the mother, that's when you have something that should be protected by the law. And the thought was, quickening is when life begins. But we know now that this whole idea of quickening, the idea that life begins when a mother can feel the fetus move, that's just not how biology works. Right? We have ultrasound imaging that we can see fetuses and embryos moving before those movements can be felt. So it's just false, then, that prior to quickening, prior to a mother feeling movement, the fetus is not alive or not moving. Biology today teaches us that there is a living thing that exists prior to quickening, and so you can see this on the ultrasound moving around even if it can't be felt. So the point here is, prior to the 1800s, the law reflect an incorrect understanding of biology. The incorrect understanding of biology said that up until quickening you have non-living matter, but once quickening occurs that's when life begins, and now we've disproven that. We've shown that biology just doesn't work that way, and in fact you have a moving living thing prior to our ability to feel it. So how does this tie into the Supreme Court's decision? Well, that quickening is false, that this whole story of quickening is false, that was proven during the 1800s. So for example, legal scholar Victor Rosenblum writes, these developments were brought to the attention of the American state legislators and public by those professionals most familiar with the unfolding import, physicians. It was the new research finding which persuaded doctors that the old quickening distinction embodied in the common and some statutory law was unscientific and indefensible. In other words, scientific and medical experts discovered that the quickening model was just mistaken. That's just, again, that's not how biology works. It's not the case that you have inanimate, non-moving matter for a huge portion of pregnancy that suddenly becomes ensouled partway through pregnancy, and that's when it, the fetus starts moving for the first time. That's just not how biology works. So the medical experts, the scientific experts, discovered this during the 1800s, and that showed that the laws which were based on the quickening model were unscientific. You could no longer defend those laws on the basis of medical science. That meant the law had to change. So a law that might allow abortion prior to quickening, but wouldn't allow it after quickening, for example, that could no longer be defended in scientific or medical terms because the idea in the law was as soon as life begins, which again they thought was at quickening, you have to protect it by the law, but life doesn't begin during the first stages of pregnancy. So now that that was shown to be false, physicians urged legislators to change the laws to reflect our growing understanding of biology. Or to put this view a little bit more simply, the critic is going to say the law has always protected the life of the unborn individual. It's just we were mistaken about when life begins. We used to think that life begins at quickening and then biological discoveries showed no actually life begins much sooner than that. And so if the law is designed to protect life, then it has to protect life before quickening as well. Now that we've discovered 
that there is a living entity existing during the early stages of pregnancy. Or as Francis Beckwith puts this point, as biology acquired more facts about human development, quickening began to be dismissed as an arbitrary and irrelevant criterion by which to distinguish between protectable and unprotectable human life. When better knowledge was acquired in the 19th century, writes Stephen Crayson, laws began to be enacted prohibiting abortion at every stage of pregnancy. So you go back to what the Supreme Court said. They said abortion was made illegal in the first place just to protect women's health. These critics are saying abortion was made illegal in the first place because our understanding of biology changed. And once we understood that previous model of quickening, which had been held to for years, once we understood that quickening was mistaken and we had a better understanding of biology, that's when the laws changed. So laws changed to protect the unborn entity because we realized that we were mistaken in thinking that there was no living being during the early stages of pregnancy. So going back to the historical argument that the Supreme Court gave, they said laws against abortion were put in place in the first place to protect women's health. Well, the critics are challenging that. They're saying, actually, no, a better explanation of why abortion was made illegal in the first place was because of these changes in understanding of biology. Once we understood that life begins earlier in pregnancy than quickening, that's when we started calling for laws to protect that life during the early stages of pregnancy, as well as the later stages. And critics are not going to stop there. They're going to say, why did the court even think that abortion was made illegal in the first place to protect women's health? And on this point, here's what the court said. When discussing that view that abortion was made illegal to protect women's health, the court says, most state laws were designed solely to protect the woman. So Justice Blackman, who wrote the decision in Roe v. Wade, adds that there is some scholarly support for this view of original purpose. In other words, there is some scholarship showing that abortion laws were put in place originally just to protect women's health. Critics are going to hone in on this passage because when Blackman talks about there being some scholarship to support this view, he cites exactly two essays written by the same person, Cyril Means, who was an attorney at the time for the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, or NARAL. So these two essays that the Supreme Court is citing come from the same person who's an attorney who's working to try to get abortion law repealed. And there's some question as to whether or not these essays actually make a good historical case for the conclusion that abortion laws were put in place to protect women's health. Not only that, but these essays were presented to the court by Roe's legal team. So these were the people who were trying to get abortion laws overturned. Regarding the essays, David Tunderman, who was a law student working on Roe's team, said that Means' conclusions sometimes strain credibility, but even so, where the important thing to do is to win the case no matter how, however, I suppose I agree with Means' technique. Begin with a scholarly attempt at historical research. If it doesn't work out, fudge it as necessary. Write a piece so long that others will read only your introduction and your conclusion, then keep citing it, until the courts begin picking it up. This preserves the guise of impartial scholarship while advancing the proper ideological goals. So critics point out that even some members of Roe's legal team thought these essays by Cyril Means didn't really hold any weight, but they were very effective at trying to accomplish the goal that the Roe team was trying to bring about. So the Roe team was focused on trying to win the case, they said, these essays will help us win the case. Whether or not they're argued well or not, that doesn't really matter. We're just going to present them to the court because they're useful. And this is concerning because, according to Beckwith at least, Means' work has come under devastating criticism, and for that reason, it's no longer even considered an authoritative rendering of abortion law. In other words, in subsequent discussions of Cyril Means' work, these two essays that the Supreme Court is relying on, a lot of people have argued that the historical story told in these essays is just completely mistaken. So just to recap, we talked about the historical argument itself, this idea that throughout much of history, abortion access was much more open than it presently was in 1973. In the U.S., the Supreme Court argued the reason abortion was made illegal in the first place in the mid-1800s was because the procedure itself was a threat to women's health, so abortion was made illegal to protect women's health. Third, with advances in medical technology, including antibiotics, as of 1973, abortion procedures are no longer a threat. And so we no longer had the same reason 
to make abortion illegal. That's the Supreme Court's story. Critics have argued that the second claim is just completely false. Abortion laws were not put in place to protect women's health, but were put in place because we recognized that our previous biological model of pregnancy, we realized that that whole model of pregnancy was mistaken. And so critics are arguing that as our understanding of biology changed, medical professionals and scientists were pushing to try to make sure that the law reflected the right understanding of biology as opposed to this outdated picture of quickening. This sort of argument, whether it succeeds or not, is going to really rest on the second claim. We need to look at the question, why was abortion made illegal in the U.S. in the first place? What were the justifications? What were the reasons for making abortion illegal? If it was just to protect women's health, then the Supreme Court seems to be correct. If abortion was made illegal because we had this changing understanding of biology, and so we decided the law should always protect life, but life begins a lot earlier than we realize, then the Supreme Court is mistaken. So in investigating this, you're going to need to look at what is the true history of abortion law. Why was abortion made illegal in the first place? Now, I mentioned that the third statement in this historical argument gets some criticism as well. So this claim that, as of 1973, abortion procedures were perfectly safe. Clark Forsyth on this point notes that there was nothing in the record or in the arguments to suggest that abortions between the 12th and 28th week of pregnancy were safe. In other words, abortions occurring during the second and third trimester, the court didn't have any data on how safe those procedures were. And the fact that there was no data on the safety of abortion performed during the second and third trimester, that makes sense because it wasn't exactly a procedure that was legal in most places in the U.S. So it wasn't well studied, it wasn't well documented, it wasn't known for sure whether or not this was going to be a safe procedure or not. So when the court is saying that the abortion procedure as of 1973 is, is really safe, during the first trimester, maybe there's some data to support that, but during the second and third, Forsyth is saying the court was really just guessing. They didn't have any good scientific data to support that claim. And this matters because, go back to the three-trimester model, the court was saying it's perfectly legal to allow abortion during the first, second, and third trimester. If a state doesn't want to restrict access at all, they don't have to. So the court is allowing abortion during the second and third trimester. They're calling it safe, but they don't have any data to support the claim that it is safe. And critics will say this actually gets a little bit worse even because the court, when talking about who is permitted to perform an abortion, the court says the term physician can be defined by the state to mean a physician currently licensed by the state and may prohibit any abortion by a person who is not a physician so defined. In other words, the court is saying if the state wants to make sure that the only people who are permitted to perform abortion procedures are licensed medical professionals, then the state can require that all abortion providers are medically licensed individuals. But that's optional. The, the court is saying the state may define physician as people who are licensed by the state, but they don't have to. So not only do we have abortions occurring during the second, third trimester where there's no data on the safety for the most part. But now the court is saying if you want licensed professionals to be the only people who perform abortions, you can, you can set the law up that way, but you don't have to. You don't have to require people to have a medical license to perform abortions if the state chooses not to put that restriction in the law. And so critics are going to point out that the court wasn't doing enough to protect the health of women here. So again, the critic is just saying, Roe asserted that abortion was safe today without any real evidence to support the claim regarding the second and third trimester, and they made it legal for non-licensed personnel to provide abortions if states want to allow that practice. And all of that seems to expose women to a lot of potential harms that could have been avoided. So critics are going to say that the Supreme Court's decision opened up the possibility of harm in many cases that could have been avoided. The court could have been a lot more strict on who can perform an abortion, where it can be performed, the, the type of facility, and all of that. But as it was, they said, states can decide what they want. So now we've gotten through one argument, we've gotten through the historical argument. There's two left. There's the 14th Amendment argument, which deals with privacy, and then there's the neutrality of law argument. And I'm just going to deal with each of those. We'll get clear on what the argument is, look at what some critics say about each, and then that'll be it. So the 14th Amendment argument, there's multiple ways in which the 14th Amendment is going to be relevant to the Roe v. Wade decision. And just to get the 14th Amendment up on the screen, it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. 
No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So this talks about citizens and persons. Persons are protected under the law, they have equal rights under the law, and the state doesn't have the right to deprive any person, whether citizen or not, of life, liberty, or property without due process. Now the right to privacy is found under that right to liberty. So this idea that the state can't deprive a person of their liberties without due process, that's where privacy exists. And the basic idea is you have a right to privacy means you have a right to be free to live your life as you see fit, at least so long as you don't interfere with the rights of others. So for example, contraceptives are thought to be a private matter. If you want to use contraceptives, that's up to you. It's not interfering with anybody else's rights. So people are free to use contraceptives or not use them as they see fit, so long as they're not interfering with anybody else's rights, at least. That's just a private matter. Similarly, the court ruled in Roe v. Wade that abortion is a private matter as well. But this raises an immediate problem, so critics are going to point out the right to privacy only applies in cases where you're not interfering with the rights of anyone else. And so the question is, when an abortion is performed, are the rights of someone else being violated? Or put differently, does an abortion interfere with the rights of another person? Because if it does, if abortion interferes with the rights of another person, then abortion can't be legal in the United States. So if abortion is going to be legal in the United States, the court has to show that an abortion procedure doesn't interfere with anybody else's rights. And that means the court is going to have to show that fetuses are not persons. So an unborn human being is not a person according to the law. And Justice Blackmun, again, who wrote the decision in Roe v. Wade, says if this suggestion of personhood is established, that is, if it's shown that fetuses are persons, then Roe's case, the case for legalized abortion, collapses for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. Roe's legal team conceded this on re-argument. In other words, if embryos and fetuses, if unborn human beings, are persons, then the entire case for legalized abortion falls apart. Roe v. Wade says that explicitly. If fetuses are persons, then there can't be legal access to abortion in the United States. So if fetuses are persons, the entire judgment in Roe v. Wade, the entire ruling, completely collapses. It falls apart. This means that the court absolutely requires a commitment to the claim that fetuses are not persons. They have to show that fetuses are not persons because the whole case rests on that claim. So why think that fetuses are not persons according to the law? Well, Justice Blackmun writes, no case could be cited that holds the fetus as a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. So you go back to the 14th Amendment and you see the state cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. And that every single person, whether citizen or not, has equal protection under the laws. So you can't take away a person's life without due process, but the Supreme Court says, look, there's no mention here of fetuses, right? It just says that persons are protected under the law. It doesn't say that fetuses are protected under the law. And more importantly, if Justice Blackmun is correct, then there were no court cases to build off of or reference when it came to extending the 14th Amendment to fetuses. So the question here is, is whether or not there were ever any court cases that ruled that the 14th Amendment, when it talks about protecting persons, having persons having equal rights under the law, were there ever any court cases that said that includes fetuses as well? And Justice Blackmun says no. There's no case, at least, that has been cited that has made the argument that the 14th Amendment protects fetuses. And so Justice Blackmun infers from this that there hasn't been any reason to think that the 14th Amendment, when it talks about protecting the rights of persons, also aims to protect the rights of fetuses. Now critics are going to get really upset here, because if you look at another court ruling, Steinberg v. Brown from 1970, so a few years before Roe v. Wade, the court ruled that contraception, which is dealt with in Griswold, another case, is concerned with preventing the creation of new and independent life. The right and power of a man or a woman to determine whether or not to participate in this process of creation is clearly a private and personal one with which the law cannot and should not interfere. In other words, questions about whether or not people want to conceive children or not, that's a private matter. So contraceptives, that's a totally private matter. 
Steinberg versus Brown continued, though, and said it seems clear, however, that the legal conclusion in Griswold as to the rights of individuals to determine without governmental interference whether or not to enter into the process of procreation cannot be extended to cover those situations wherein, voluntarily or involuntarily, the preliminaries have ended and a new life has begun. Once a human life has commenced, the constitutional protections found in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments impose upon the state a duty to safeguard it. What Steinberg versus Brown ruled then is that contraceptives are a matter of privacy because choosing whether or not to conceive a new life, that's a private matter. But once life has begun, the 14th Amendment protects it. And so Steinberg versus Brown says very clearly, life in utero, whether an embryo or a fetus, that counts as a person. That's protected under the 14th Amendment. And remember, Justice Blackman in Roe v. Wade had just said there was no case that has ever done this. There's no case that's ever argued that the 14th Amendment protects fetuses as persons, and so we don't have any reason to think that fetuses are persons. But they missed this case. So Steinberg versus Brown did exactly that. It said the 14th Amendment does protect unborn life, and just as Blackman, the other justices, and the legal teams involved, they just missed this point. So critics are going to point out that when Justice Blackman says there's no other court case in history that's ever applied the 14th Amendment to the unborn, they're going to say, no, there was, but it was overlooked in the Roe v. Wade decision. So the Roe v. Wade decision was based on false information. But to be fair, that was just one reason that Justice Blackman gives for thinking a fetus is not a person. He gives a lot of other reasons as well. So one of those reasons that no court has ever referred to the fetuses as being protected by the 14th Amendment, that's a bad reason because there, there was at least one court that did that. But there are other reasons for thinking that fetuses are not persons under the law. So in Roe v. Wade, Justice Blackmun writes, the Constitution does not define person in so many words. In fact, in nearly all these instances where the word person is used, the use of the word is such that its application occurs only postnatally. None indicates with any assurance that it has any possible prenatal application. So here's what he's saying. Go and look at the Constitution, and every time it uses the word person, it looks like the use of the word person couldn't extend to fetuses. So, for example, when the Constitution talks about citizens who are defined as persons born or naturalized in the United States. Persons born, obviously that's not going to apply to fetuses. Furthermore, Justice Blackman writes, the word person is used when describing qualifications for running as either a representative or as a senator, and those clearly don't apply to fetuses either. And finally, when the word person is being used in the apportionment clause, which talks about who gets counted in a census, it's clear that the Constitution doesn't count fetuses in the census. So if it's not counting fetuses in the census, that's evidence that, constitutionally, fetuses should not be considered persons. Now, critics aren't going to like this argument either. What they're going to start by saying is that the Constitution is not designed to tell us who is and who is not a person. That's not its job. There's no attempt to define the word person. All the Constitution does is tell us how persons ought to be treated. So every person is protected equally under the law. No person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, and so forth. That explains how persons should be treated. But nowhere does it even attempt to tell us who is and who isn't a person, or what criteria are required for being a person or not. None of that enters into the Constitution. So to treat the Constitution as trying to provide us with a definition of personhood, that's to misuse the document. More importantly, when you look at these particular references that we just talked about, citizen is what's being defined, not person. So citizens are those defined as persons born or naturalized in the U.S., but that just means that citizens are a type of person. And surely there are other types of persons other than citizens. So whether you're a citizen or not, you're still protected by the 14th Amendment. All persons are equally protected under the law, whether you're a citizen or not. So a definition of citizen, that's not going to tell us anything about whether or not a fetus is a person. That's going to tell us that a fetus doesn't count as a citizen, which is just a different matter. Or put simply, just because somebody is not a citizen, that doesn't mean they're not a person. There are lots of people who are not citizens. Second, when we're looking at the qualifications for running as a senator or as a representative, you've got to be 30 years or older to run for the Senate, whereas to run as a representative, you have to be 25 years or older. 
And so, true enough, those qualifications don't apply to fetuses. Fetuses can't satisfy those criteria because they're not 25 years old or 30 years old. So obviously when the Constitution is talking about qualifications for running for Senate or the House, that's not going to apply to fetuses. But the problem here is that it doesn't apply to a lot of people. Anybody who's younger than 25 would not count as a person. If to count as a person you have to be eligible for running for the House, that means to count as a person you have to be 25 years old. And it's entirely inconsistent with the Constitution to hold the view that personhood begins at age 25. In other words, these qualifications regarding running for the Senate or running for the House, it has nothing to do with personhood because if only beings that satisfy those qualifications count as persons, then that means anyone who's younger than 25 is not a person, and that's not consistent with the Constitution at all. And third, when it comes to who gets counted in the census or not, critics are going to say this again doesn't have anything to do with who's a legal person and who's not. After all, the Constitution says that non-taxed indigenous peoples are not counted in the census either. And so if being counted in the census is what makes you a person, which gets you equal protection under the law, then Roe v. Wade is saying that non-taxed indigenous peoples are not persons. Or to put it a little bit differently, there are a lot of individuals, including fetuses, that don't get counted in the census, but just because you don't get counted in the census, that doesn't mean you're not a person. If not getting counted in the census meant you're not a person, then Roe v. Wade would be saying that non-taxed indigenous peoples are not people. And that's something that, again, is just thoroughly unconstitutional. Even worse at this point, one critic named Joshua Craddock argues that if you look at the 14th Amendment, look at how it was talked about when it was ratified, it becomes clear that the people who wrote the 14th Amendment, who got it put into place, believed that all human beings, whether born or unborn, should be protected under the law. So Craddock notes the primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, intended to ensure that, quote, no state in the Union should deny to any human being the equal protections of the law. In other words, the people who were involved in the 14th Amendment itself seemed to think there was no important distinction between person and human being. So all human beings, on their view, were persons. And that seems to at least suggest that human beings that were born or unborn should count as persons. So if you look at what the original writers of the 14th Amendment thought about it, the people who were involved in the legal decisions at the time, there was no important distinction between human being and person. So when Roe v. Wade introduces that sort of thinking, suggesting that fetuses may be human beings, but they're not persons according to the 14th Amendment, this is refusing to look at the 14th Amendment in the context in which it was written, or through the eyes of the people who actually put it together. If the critics are right here, so critics like Craddock, if they're right here, then that means the 14th Amendment, when it was written, it was intended to include unborn human beings, and the fact that it's not being applied in that way is kind of a twisting of what its original intent was. And remember, this whole discussion is crucial because Roe v. Wade states that if fetuses are persons, then there can be no real right to legalized abortion. The whole case for legalized abortion rests on the claim that fetuses are not persons according to the law. So those who think that abortion should remain legal, they've got to continue to argue that fetuses are not persons according to the law. We've looked at some of the reasons that the court gave. So in Roe v. Wade, the court said that there were no cases that extended the 14th Amendment to unborn human beings. Critics are going to point out that Steinberg v. Brown shows that that's false. Then the court said that anytime the word person is used in the Constitution, it doesn't seem to be used in a way that can apply to fetuses. And then critics pointed out that, yeah, person doesn't apply to fetuses in many cases, but it doesn't apply to 24-year-olds in some cases. It doesn't apply to non-taxed indigenous people in other cases. And so critics are going to say, if you take Roe v. Wade at its word, it looks like it's committed to the view that lots of individuals don't count as persons when we know better. And furthermore, critics are going to say, the Constitution was not designed to try to define personhood in the first place, so to try to find a definition of personhood in the Constitution is misusing the document for what it is. But whatever the case, this whole argument, the 14th Amendment argument and the right to privacy, the idea that abortion is a private matter, that hinges on the assumption that fetuses are not persons. I think every side agrees on that. The court themselves say that if the fetus is a person, we can't legalize abortion. So everyone seems to agree that if fetuses are persons in a legal sense, you can't allow abortion. 
That means the court and anyone who defends Roe v. Wade has to make the argument that fetuses are not persons in a legal sense, whereas critics are just going to pick apart the Supreme Court's reasoning in various ways that we've already seen, and they're going to make the argument that if you look at the Constitution in the context in which it was written, what the intentions were of the people who actually wrote the 14th Amendment, who got it put into place, it becomes clear that they intended the word person to refer to all human beings, whether born or not. And so this is where the debate rests when it comes to the 14th Amendment and the right to privacy. The question is, can you prove that fetuses are not persons according to the law, or can you show that fetuses are persons according to the law? And that's where the battle is going to be fought. Finally, there's this third argument that the court gives in support of its overarching decision. So we go back, you got the three trimester model. One of the other major arguments that the court gives here is that the court has to be neutral with respect to the question of when life begins. So remember, in the Roe v. Wade case, Texas's law is what's being challenged here. Texas's law said that abortion is illegal in all cases except for saving the mother's life, and Texas had argued that life begins at conception. So the view that life begins at conception was what Texas wanted the law to reflect. Justice Blackmun, however, writes that Texas urges that life begins at conception and is present throughout pregnancy, and that, therefore, the state has a compelling interest in protecting that life from and after conception. We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus. The judiciary, at this point in the development of man's knowledge, is not in a position as to speculate as to the answer. So what Justice Blackman is saying here is that there's tons of disagreement about when life begins. So some people think life begins at conception, some people think that life begins at birth, and so there's all this disagreement about it, and Justice Blackman is saying it's not the court's job to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Even the experts in this case haven't been able to come to any sort of consensus, so the court's just going to step back and say, we don't, we don't take a side in terms of when life begins or not. And importantly, Justice Blackman continues, we do not agree that by adopting one theory of life, Texas may override the rights of the pregnant woman that are at stake. So the basic idea is this. Roe v. Wade is saying the courts should not take a side when it comes to debates over about when life begins and when it doesn't. Some people think life begins at conception, but the government shouldn't adopt that view as policy. The court should step back and should not allow the government to accept any one of these views as policy, because to do that would be to force on other people views that they might not accept. In other words, the courts should remain neutral on the question of when life begins, because again, there's all this disagreement. So Texas doesn't have the right to impose on other people the view that life begins at conception, and therefore Texas's laws are ruled unconstitutional. At this stage, though, critics are going to say the Supreme Court is being entirely hypocritical. We've seen throughout the entire document that they refer to the fetus as potential life. So potential life is something other than actual life. In other words, the language of the Supreme Court itself, they adopt this view that fetuses are potential life only. They're not actually living things. And so the Supreme Court is adopting one view of life. They're saying that life doesn't begin at conception, merely a potential life begins at conception, and the state has some right to restrict abortion access to protect potential life. But they are taking a side. They're saying that potential life is what's occurring during pregnancy as opposed to actual life. So they're not actually being neutral here. They're saying that Texas's view of life, that life begins at conception, is mistaken. It's false. And even worse, when we were looking at the 14th Amendment argument just a minute ago, they made the argument that if fetuses are legal persons, the right to abortion kind of collapses. There is no right to abortion if fetuses are legal persons. And so the court did rule that abortion is legal. So you look at these two claims next to each other. You have, on one hand, the ruling of Roe v. Wade that says abortion is perfectly legal. Second, you have this claim that if fetuses are legal persons, then abortion should be made illegal. You put these two claims together, and they actually entail a third claim, namely that fetuses are not persons. In other words, the court's entire ruling rests on this claim that fetuses are not persons. They have to assume that fetuses are not persons in order to justify their entire decision. But if they're assuming that fetuses are not persons, they're saying fetuses are merely a potential life, it's not an actual life, fetuses are not persons, and so on, they are taking a side. They are not neutral in this question of when does life begin. They're saying very explicitly that the view that life begins at conception is just false, it's mistaken. 
Because if that were true, then laws would have to change radically. So again, when the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade is saying the court is not in a position to speculate as to the answer of when life begins, they are saying it doesn't begin at conception because if it did, then abortion shouldn't be allowed anywhere. So by rejecting the view that life begins at conception, by referring to fetuses as potential life rather than actual life, they are not being neutral. And in fact, it just might not be possible to be neutral here. If the courts allow access to abortion, they say access to abortion is perfectly legal, that requires the view that fetuses are not persons. They have to accept that fetuses are not persons if they're going to allow access to abortion. And so, if you allow access to abortion, if you say it's perfectly legal, you're committed to this view that fetuses are not legal persons. If, on the other hand, you're committed to the view that fetuses are legal persons, then Roe v. Wade states very clearly that abortion should not be legal. And so it seems impossible for the court to actually be neutral here. So when they say it's beyond the court's ability to speculate as to when life begins, well, they are speculating about that because they're saying very clearly that fetuses are not living persons. They are potential life only. And so they are taking a side. They're not capable of being neutral. So, okay, this has been a long talk, but where does this leave us? Just to recap, Roe v. Wade had said that there's this three trimester model. During the first trimester, the state can't interfere with abortion access. During the second trimester, the state can interfere with abortion access only in cases where interference promotes and protects the health of the mother. And during the third trimester, the state can prohibit abortion. They can say abortion is illegal during the third trimester unless a mother's life or health is at risk. And there were a couple of really important observations here. First, all restrictions are optional. So in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court is saying the states can restrict abortion during the second and third trimester to some extent if they want to, but they don't have to. You can have completely open access to abortion if you want. That's perfectly legal. And secondly, we looked at this problem of how do we define health. The Supreme Court defined it in such a broad way, including physical, mental, emotional, familial well-being, that it became very difficult for states to actually prevent abortions from occurring in the third trimester. We also outlined some of the major arguments in Roe v. Wade, and I gave you the critics' perspective on these arguments as well. So we had the historical argument, the 14th Amendment argument, or the right to privacy argument, and the neutrality argument. We looked at what the Supreme Court said in each case. We looked at the actual text of the Supreme Court's decision, and we looked at what critics have said about it. Now, it's worth pointing out that you can be a critic of Roe v. Wade and still think that abortion should be legal. In other words, just because you reject Roe v. Wade, that doesn't make you anti-abortion. There are going to be a lot of people who say that Roe v. Wade came to the right conclusions, allowing access to abortion was the right thing to do, but the reasoning was not great. So the reasoning to get to the conclusion was really bad, but the conclusions themselves were good. And so these sorts of critics are going to say Roe v. Wade has a lot of problems in terms of its reasoning and in terms of its history, but the conclusion, the result, is the right one. And so the goal for these critics will be to defend that same result along some different lines. There are also going to be critics who say that Roe v. Wade didn't go far enough. And so remember, in Roe v. Wade, they consider the view that a woman should just have a choice to an abortion at any time for any reason, and that's just purely her choice. She is the one and only authority who can make that sort of decision. The court said they disagreed with that view. They didn't think that the right to privacy was absolute. They thought there were a lot of cases in which the state actually had every right to interfere with and to restrict access to abortion. So some critics of Roe v. Wade are going to say abortion should purely be up to the individual's choice. The state should have nothing to do with it at all. They shouldn't put any restrictions in place whatsoever. And so Roe v. Wade didn't do enough. It didn't go far enough. And there are going to be critics who think that abortion should remain legal, but just that Roe v. Wade did a really bad job of interpreting and using the Constitution. So as Joshua Craddock notes when talking about the late Justice Scalia, he held that neither side in the abortion debate should attempt to use the courts to enforce a national policy on abortion. And so specifically, Justice Scalia said, I would strike down Roe v. Wade, but I would also strike down a law that is the opposite of Roe v. Wade. You know, both sides in the debate want the Supreme Court to decide the matter for them. One side in the debate wants no state to be able to prohibit abortion, so this is the pro-choice side, and the other side in the debate wants every state to have to prohibit abortion. That's the pro-life side. But they're both wrong. That's how I read the Constitution. In other words, what people like Justice Scalia are saying is it shouldn't be the court's job to make a national policy 
for whether or not abortion is legal or not. That should be left up to the states. So for example, if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned today, that doesn't mean that abortion would suddenly become illegal everywhere in the United States. Rather, it means whether abortion is legal, under what circumstances, in what sorts of ways, what sorts of restrictions can be put in place on access to abortion. All of that is going to be decided by state legislators. So if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, it's, it's suddenly up to the states to determine for themselves whether or not abortion is going to be legal or not, under what circumstances, in what ways. All of that is going to be decided at the state level. And this means that in some states, if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, access to abortion probably wouldn't change a whole lot. States already have in place laws that would take over for Roe v. Wade and allow access to abortion to continue just like it has. In other states, access to abortion would be severely restricted. And so if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, what you would see is suddenly the control over abortion access would be up to state legislators and not federal courts. And this just seems to be what the originalist type of thought says here is that the courts should not be the ones who are shaping national policy on abortion access. It should be left up to state legislators. So the courts shouldn't be the ones who are dictating what the policies are at a national level. Rather, the issue of whether or not abortion should be legal or not, that should just be left up to the states to decide on their own. So again, even those who think that Roe v. Wade is flawed or wrongly decided, that doesn't mean that you're anti-abortion. It just might mean that you have a different view of the Constitution or you think that the reasoning in Roe v. Wade is really problematic in some ways. And so again, even if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that doesn't mean abortion is suddenly going to be illegal everywhere. It's just going to be up to state legislators to make their own decisions at that point. This has been a bit of a marathon. My hope is that no matter what your view is on the abortion debate, you've come out of this session with a better understanding of what Roe v. Wade says and why they said it. So we went over some details of what the actual ruling was, what their conclusions were, and we looked at three major arguments that they gave in support of those conclusions, and then we considered some criticisms of those arguments as well. So now not only do we have some of the key details of Roe v. Wade in front of you, but you've got some reasons for the decision and some reasons against that decision that we can kind of discuss and debate. That said, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know in the discussion board and I'll see you there.